building the chase into your project so that we have our enemy ghost chasing after our existing object is not it's not something that's dramatically different it's just taking pieces of things that we've already worked with and now integrated them into kind of a different purpose so I had my vehicle my main object that we were working with previously and now I have my enemy that's going to be chasing it and I've conveniently labeled it ghost because this enemy is able to pass through walls so it does not confine itself to running into walls but if you didn't want it to pass through walls it wouldn't be a huge imposition to add that functionality into it and we'll talk about that in a little bit so I have my enemy and then I say you know, ghost is new enemy so what probably makes sense is to then look at the enemy class so we can do that down over here the enemy class is surprisingly similar to uh, my vehicle class which ended up right here. Here's the vehicle class so it has an x, y width height, speed x, speed y. These things all get defined. Now if I look at my enemy, the enemy is almost the same except I decided to add in a, a property of color so it can now have its own color because I decided I was thinking ahead in terms of if this particular sprite object then runs into my vehicle object perhaps I want to change its color so by having its color represented by a variable I can just reassign that value currently I'm choosing a color that is white with a kind of a somewhat transparency it's a it's a, it's a little more than 50% uh, uh, solid so, and then it's spawning in some random location. So every time we start the project, it spawns in a random location. That was a failed attempt, so we'll just get that out of there. So it's now spawning somewhere inside the confines of the walls of the maze. That's what my random value here is generating. Now, let's see, update and display it looks pretty similar to update and display of my vehicle but it has I decided to add in one other method as part of this where it gets to update what direction it's going to be going and when it updates the direction it's going then at that point it changes its speed x and speed y to appropriate values r l u and d of course right left up and down so those make sense. So when we update its direction, we're going to send it a value. And I'll talk a little bit about why it makes sense to do it this way versus accessing the properties of the object outside of the class. There's a convention when you're within writing programs and you create objects. In this case, my enemy is an object. My vehicle is an object. These are objects. They're classes. When I do that, the ideal way of interfacing or engaging or working with that class object is to just send it messages and then let that object itself figure out what it's supposed to do with that message. So instead of in my main program saying ghost.speedx equals one or ghost at speed y equals zero I just send it a message a direction and then inside the class itself I determine how I want to update its speed so I'm separating out what I can effectively know about that object so that I just send it a message and say hey I think you should do this and here's the parameter of what you need to do and then let the object itself figure out what it's supposed to do. So that's referred to in the world of programming as encapsulation. And it's kind of a big issue when you're working with objects or with classes that you want a class to be encapsulated so all you do is send messages to it and tell it hey here's something that you could do and then you let the class figure out how to do it. 
instead of you telling that object specifically what it's supposed to do, you let the objects worry about themselves. The objects then become a little bit more self-contained and significantly more powerful. So it's a little different than what we, I uh, well, no, it's similar because all we do is make left or right happen and then our vehicle is updating based on those key commands. So it's similar to what we did with the vehicle. Now, when my game starts, let's see, set up, game state, start, start game, renders it out. When we move into play game, that's where the magic happens. Render the map, we update the vehicle, see if the vehicle hit any walls, and then we're going to do a chase for the ghost. And then the ghost gets to update, the ghost gets to display, and then the vehicle gets to display. Now if you notice on chase, we're sending two objects to it. We're sending the vehicle and we're sending the ghost. Doing it in this manner opens up the possibility that I could now have two ghosts. I could have three ghosts. I could have a hundred ghosts and then they could all be chasing that same vehicle making this an extremely difficult activity. So we have a chase function that we're sending those two objects to it. So when we look at chase right here, these lines came directly out of working with the wall collisions. So we figure out the distance x and y uh, the width and uh, half width, half height, I don't actually need these in here, so I, but they were still in here um, from doing some stuff from before. We could get rid of them and no harm would uh, come to the performance, but because we can see here there's no reference to it. Now this uh, maximum distance between the vehicle and this enemy object is important when we're going to want to set a parameter so at times we may not want the ghost to be chasing we may want to have it so that we're within a certain distance of the ghost and then it becomes aware of our presence and then starts chasing us so it's not chasing us the whole time so that kind of makes it more fun especially when you have more than one chasing object that they're not always chasing all the time so that you have the chance you might be able to get away from them and then that's kind of cool. So dist x, dist y, what we're calculating there is the distance between the vehicle and the enemy. So how far away are they on the x-axis? How far away are they from each other on the y-axis? So that's what we're trying to calculate with those two values. So when we have our two objects on screen, we're trying to figure out how far apart are they horizontally and vertically. And then we figure out what is the actual straight line distance between those two objects. So that if I were to draw a line between those two objects, how far apart are they? Now the algorithm that I'm working with here so that we compare the distance apart on X versus the distance apart on Y. If the distance apart X is greater, then we want it to start closing that distance first. Now you could go the other way, but you know it, it's really kind of up to you as to which direction you would want to go with it. But when we see this run, You'll notice it's closing the greater distance first. So now we're horizontally apart. Now when I'm vertically apart, you can see now it's closing the vertical distance first. So it keeps adjusting based on what is the greater of the two. Is it horizontally further apart? Or is it vertically further apart? And uses that as the basis for what movement it's going to use. And then when it gets arranged 
so that it's exactly you know, at a 45, then it starts to move what appears to be in a diagonal manner. Because it closes one movement on the x-axis, now the y is greater than does one on the y, then one on the x, one on the y. So when it gets to be at a 45 degree angle, it will actually start to go in that 45 degree angle. And there would be some ways that you could close it so it would only keep moving in that one direction until some event. Um, and there's, there's just a lot of options, a lot of possibilities of how you might go about doing this. But the main logic here is we figure out, are we further apart based on x or further apart based on y? And if we're further apart based on x, then we then calculate, should the object be moving to the right or should it move to the left based on the dist x being a positive value or a negative value? So again, to see it in action, so right now it's moving to the right because the math that I'm working with here calculates distance x is the vehicle's x position minus the enemy's x position. So now we will see a negative value because the vehicle is at a smaller amount, the enemy is at a higher x value, so then when I do the math that gives me a negative number. So when distance x is positive, that means the enemy needs to move to the right. So it can start chasing over. When distance x is a negative value, the enemy needs to start walking off to the left. Same thing with up and down. So when distance y is greater than zero, then that means the vehicle is down and the ghost is up high, so it needs to start going down to close the gap. So looking here, you can see the first time through, I did not encapsulate my class, but I specifically took my enemy and modified its speed x and modified its speed y. And I told it what numbers I wanted to pass to it and all kinds of crap like that. And I left that in here because it illustrates a key point. The first time that you write something when you're coding it, it's probably not going to be the best form or the most efficient way of doing it. The goal is to get it working. Once it's working, then you work on figuring out how can you do this better or properly or you know the so-called right way. I'd like to say there is a right way, but if you give 10 programmers the same thing to solve, you'll get 10 dramatically different solutions because there is not a right way. There are different ways and some are better and some are faster, but there isn't a right way. So I can now have it hard-coded in here, but it's all commented out because a better way would be to tell the enemy I would access one of its methods and I would send it an information piece about what direction do I want the enemy to start traveling in. So I'm just sending it information saying, enemy, you know, I'd like you to update your direction to the right. Now the enemy at this point can be figuring out, hey, have I hit a wall? Have I gone off screen? Have I? So the enemy can worry about what happens when it goes right. But my main program then doesn't need to know that. And the advantage of doing this is then I could now take this enemy and I could now dump it into another project and it would then be much easier to get it working when the enemy is self-contained and all I do is just access its methods and send it parameters in those methods and let it do what it will versus hard coding it into my program. When I do this, that means I'm using a, my class in a much less efficient manner because I won't be able to use that class or reuse that class in a future project with as much ease. So I call its update direction method, pass in a value, left, right, up, or down, down or up, and wander all the way down here into the enemy, and we'll see update direction. It accepts a string, 
Well, remember I passed a thing in quotation marks. If it's in quotation marks, that means it's a string. And then I say, hey, if that value was r, now I set my speed x and speed y. If my value was l, set my speed x and speed y. If the value was u, set my speed x and speed y. If the value was d, set speed x and speed y. So at this point, I'm able to control it very easily. And then its update method just updates its x and y based on speed x and speed y. Its display has a fill command, and then it draws its rectangle where it's at. I'm going to make my ghost a little bit more transparent because he's just too solid for my taste. He, if he's part of, you know, the no longer living, he shouldn't be. Yeah, there. Now he looks more. Oh, I'm in a corner. No! Oh, crap. He goes through walls. No! And now you can figure out what happens when the collision occurs. So we can have some fun with it. So as promised at the beginning, distance max, which is the distance between the two objects, would come into play. It would be useful by saying, hey, if the distance between the two objects is less than 100, so they're less than 100 pixels apart, I want the ghost to start chasing my vehicle or player. So when that distance max is less than that, then I go through and send in my left, right, up, or down directions to the enemy. But only then, which is why they wait until they're within 100 pixels. So when the player moves within 100 pixels and is being a careless uh, vehicle, then at that point, the enemies start chasing them, or the ghosts. But then the ghosts stop chasing and continue moving in their own direction. So what we can say as part of it, if the distance max is less than 100, start effectively this chunk of code says start chasing and in what direction. Otherwise, we can tell it to stop. So if the distance between the two objects is less than 100, they go through the routine to figure out should they move left, right, left, down, or up. But if that distance is greater than 100, then the enemy is issued an update direction command of stop. Now this does introduce one interesting thing. It's theoretically possible that distance could be exactly 100 well no okay this no this works so less than 100 they chase otherwise 100 or more pixels apart then the enemy just stops moving because it's told to stop because when it has a command of stop with update direction it sets speed x and speed y both equal to zero